Do you still get nervous when you get on court? Yeah, I mean, surprisingly, yes, in the first round or second round or third round, and sometimes not in the semis. Uh, you, I can't predict when I'm going to be nervous because mm. sometimes I sleep really well. I wake up and I feel like, wow, today's a great day. I feel good in practice. Next thing you know, I like walk, on, walk on court and I play uh, really poorly or I'm super nervous or the other way around. You mm. know, it's just like I felt horrible all day, but then I play a dream match. So there's no real um, secret to it. How do you separate what's going on up here with what's happening on court? Because mental strength, physical strength are both that need to be in tandem yeah. for any athlete. Absolutely, they need to be connected. Yeah. And uh, then that's where confidence can help in a big, big way. Because you might be actually not feeling great physically or mentally you're drained but the confidence somehow gets you through. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have confidence, that's then when you have to um, sort of trust all the hard work you've done and you have to keep on working hard so success comes back. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's when it becomes tricky, I think, when confidence sort of totally leaves you or you doubt your confidence, you know? Who have you enjoyed playing against? I mean, when you look at some of your opponents that you've had, from the likes of, you know, Andre Agassi, Pete Sampras, you know, more recently, Rafael Nadal and, and uh, Novak Djokovic, these are the yeah. bigger name players I'm mentioning. Who do you feel has challenged you so much that you've had to pull out every single bit of arsenal that you've got? Right. Um, well, there's definitely a few of them, you know, and they go in phases. Yeah. My favorite time, in a way, was when I was coming up and about, just because I was playing against a guy from TV, and I was like, really, am I playing against Pete Sampras or Andre Agassi or, you know, those kind of guys, Carlos Moya, Tim Henman, you know, you name it. And I was like, wow, this guy's got such beautiful volleys, or his form's amazing, or his serve is outrageous. I've never seen a guy return like this. And... Uh, that you're on the same court is like an honor and that uh, is something that really marks you and it's like that kid in the candy store feeling mm. and then all of a sudden the younger guys push through and that was a very strong generation with Rafa, mm -hmm. uh, Murray and, and Djokovic and uh, so playing against them in the beginning is honestly quite strange because now here you are sort of the older guy mm -hmm. and they kind of look up to you but not quite they, but, and they want to beat you because I'm not 10 years apart with there but sort of only five or six but it is like a new generation and that's mentally for me was quite a challenge just getting over that hurdle and I think Rafa for that matter because of the way he plays with his left-handed uh, topspin and so forth he has really made me you know think through my game again mm. what do I need to change to actually um, compete and beat him and he's been the most challenging for me probably overall combined with Leighton Hewitt in the beginning of my career to play against. I read this really interesting article. I think it was called Federer as a Religious Experience. Mm. It was written by the novelist David Foster Wallace. And for me, I think, uh, I actually felt that when it was the 2007 Wimbledon final between you and Nadal. Mm -hmm. And that game was, you could see the two very different styles of tennis you know, battling it out against each other. Mm. It was a beautiful, beautiful game. You've got muscle, power, strength, finesse, and style all in one game. Right. What point do you think you felt comfortable within your own skin and your own game to be able to produce this thing of beauty? Yeah, I mean, there's some matches in your career that you look back on and you're like, you're so happy and proud that you were part of it. And I think, I think it was actually the 2008 finals. In the seven, we played a, best, a five setter as well. And then in 2008, I lost that epic 9-7, I think, in the fifth. Yeah. And I think that's the match that everybody sort of still talks about as being that one of the greatest matches of all time. And it's just special being part of that. And you start to feel that once you enter like an epic fourth or fifth set, 
and you realize that sort of the world has you know is standing still around you yeah. and everybody's now just maybe glued to the TV even though people are doing their own thing on the other side of the planet or elsewhere um, but it felt like that and uh, maybe the match should have been in, like interrupted at the end of the match because of darkness but you cannot interrupt that kind of match right then because people want to see this epic finish and that's what happened you know Rafa the way he won it was unbelievable but for me it was cool really to be f part of it and I don't look back at that and think this was my most, most crushing loss in my life. I don't see it that way, I see it as, as something more positive actually because I already had won um, five or six now, I don't remember, uh, Wimbledon's before that. Yeah. So I was naturally super disappointed in that but thankfully I've had some of those incredible matches not only against Rafa but other players too which sort of connect you forever um, with that player or wi with the venue, with the center court, with the fans and that's what's so I think so beautiful about sports in general you just don't know the outcome and you see that you know um, the different styles against each other the fairness hopefully as well which was the case in that match so it was, it was a very very special be part of that it's one of those moments you look back on as a as a player and a, and a father and a husband you're like oh my god that's like the perfect moment can we like freeze that one forever